I was um, born and raised in suburban Cleveland in a uh, uh, environment. Uh, it was it was the um, uh, 60s and early 70s, and uh, pre computers, pre internet, uh, and I basically was in what I'd call kind of a not quite a working class community, but uh, definitely not a a rich neighborhood by a long shot. And um, I discovered early on that I was good at art and interested in art and had a certain talent for drawing and an interest in visual things. And um, almost by accident kind of discovered that it was possible to um, do this for a living uh, when I discovered that there was a profession called graphic design. Uh, so I um, I went to uh, college and got a degree in uh, in in graphic design, and um, I've been doing that ever since. I'm 60 years old now, so this has been going on now for many, many, many decades, and I've sort of <laughs> seen the business that I'm in change over that period of time considerably. Yeah, and I definitely I want to ask you a little bit about that to kind of give students some perspective. Um, but let let me start with. Um, before the Clark's forklift story, I've heard you tell, <laughs> did, you, did you want to be a, a designer or did that kind of spark it? Was that kind of a first, first thought toward that? Um, the, design is of, um, the difference between art and design is actually sort of a confusing and much debated one. Um, but they are different impulses, and they can coexist in the same person. And I think that they, um, you know, they can almost be seen as two sides to the same coin sometimes. Mm -hmm. But there's um, art that has to do with craftsmanship and beauty in many ways, not exclusively, but, you know, th that in my mind, at least, it has to do with that part of of what artists do and what some designers do and design which has to do with purposefulness and problem solving and so i think you know there's a lot of artists who actually aren't solving problems they're just creating things of beauty or things that are just provocative visually in some way or another and likewise there are some engineers and other people that solve problems mathematicians solve problems you know um you know, orthodontists solve problems. You know, there are a lot of people who solve problems. And somehow the, where those two things meet is like where where I found myself getting really interested. I like drawing. I like being quote unquote creative, coming up with ideas. Um, I like making things. But I also like making things that sort of seem to be actually um, um, doing something that actually had a purpose. So, uh you know, making a abstract sculpture just for its own sake didn't motivate me as much as making a chair you could sit on, let's say. You know, I mean, sort of it's uh, uh, the first is art, the second is design. And so I think uh, when as a kid, I remember, you know, seeing uh, that logo you mentioned for Clark forklift trucks and uh, sort of being struck by its ingenuity and cleverness and thinking, wow, I would love to be the kind of person who would make that kind of thing. And I think that's different than going to a museum and seeing a beautiful painting of a landscape and thinking, I would love to learn how to paint a landscape that good. Although that was, I would love to learn how to paint a landscape that good. There was something really compelling about, uh, you know, doing something that wouldn't necessarily be in a museum just to be looked at, but would be actually identifying a piece of construction equipment yeah. out there in the real world with mud all over it. I sort of liked the, I, I, I was excited by the latter in a way. And I, it didn't give me the idea to do that, but I think helped crystallize a, a whole series of interlocking interests that I had that ended up kind of increasing as I got older and more mature and better at, better at what I did. Yeah, yeah. And did you find that your uh, parents um, at that time were very uh, encouraging of your interest in art and design or did, yeah. was that a... Um, they, they, there was somewhat, I, I mean, I don't think, I, I was kind of like, as a parent of three children now, I know how, uh, um, you know, the, 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 all of them eventually, each of them have done things that have, that have been baffled by and sometimes uh, angered by, um, but just as often or even more often 
um, touched by and inspired by and and uh, thrilled by. And I think um, uh, my parents kind of found me found my interest sort of confusing. Neither of them were artists, but uh, um, you know, I got kind of unequivocal love from both of them. And I was fortunate in that my father's business was selling printing equipment. And for many years, I kind of discounted the influence that he had on me in terms of the decisions I made about my career. Because I, I sort of thought I was making these decisions completely independently. You know, certainly my parents who didn't know anything because they're just my parents, what would they know? But the fact that my dad actually, um, although he was certainly wasn't a designer himself, uh, wouldn't have claimed that he had any special art ability. Um, he, you know, he sold machines that made the kind of things that I really liked. And, um, you know, you know, his machines would print magazines and books and posters and flyers and brochures and the kind of things that actually I ended up, uh, you know, getting trained to design myself. And, um, and so I think, um, he was a really great, uh, um cheerleader for me and once he sort of realized what i was interested in started you know if he was you know if he was selling something to an advertising agency say he would he, sometimes he'd see things you know in their offices and say hey do you have an extra one of those i'll take it home to my kids so he would like bring me home these things that were actually kind of really inspiring some of which i still have you know yeah. uh you know 40 plus years later nearly 50 years later i've got some somewhere laying around my attic you know so uh um the encouragement i got from both my parents particularly my dad has really was sustained me uh um you know early on and even uh after their deaths kind of continue to kind of inspire me in retrospect yeah let's uh let's talk a little bit about um what you do how you do that, uh, maybe some of the processes and tools, and then a little bit of the why. Uh, maybe we can kind of merge all those together. And, sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I am at present um, a partner in a large design firm located in New York City called Pentagram. Um, as a partner, I manage you can tell I'm in New York City, lots of traffic noise from outside. Does that bother you? Uh, no, no. Okay. <laughs> As a partner here at Pentagram, um, I manage a team of about um, 10 people, uh, some of whom are, um, are administrative managers, some of whom kind of help out with planning and project management and strategy, uh, but the majority of whom are designers, designers who probably went either to art school or to a design program in, at a university. And they range from being entry-level um, designers who are in their early 20s to more experienced ones who might be in their early 30s or so. Um, and um, my I, my role kind of during the day, I'll do everything from um, being in meetings with clients. We get hired by clients who bring us assignments and say, could you help us do this? Uh, we think you have the skills to accomplish this and we support them in those efforts. And so sometimes I'll just, I can spend a whole day in meetings with clients where I never do anything that would look like design or art or any form of creativity. All I'm doing is listening, asking questions and taking notes. And then I'll um, have another day where I spend a lot of time working with my designers as we kind of create visual solutions to the problems that we've been um, uh, given by our clients and the different other situations we find ourselves in. So we could be designing websites or posters or um, animations or um, books or um, logos or all kinds of different things for all kinds of different um, uh, institutions and organizations, large and small. And so um, on my desk, I've got a laptop computer and, uh, um, you know, a drawing pad and stuff to draw with. And most of my designers have that same combination of things at their, uh, at their workstations as well. Would you say for someone looking to kind of get into school uh, design now that education is still important, uh, specifically uh, college, or would you say that there are some good alternative paths? Um, 
the the thing that, well there's a, there's a combination of things to do graphic design which is what i do um certainly at the entry level requires um a set of skills that you have to acquire some way or another you know um much of it is done with um uh, computers or other kinds of digital technologies. So there are some basic software programs you have to master. There's a kind of, um, uh, of craftsmanship you have to be able to do at the digital level. I think just a function in nearly any modern office that does graphic design. Um, so, so I think you can acquire those skills a lot of different ways. I bet you could acquire those skills through like, you know, self-directed online programs. To a certain degree, um, so the so the basic craft level, I think you could probably master without any formal education. Now, someone could disagree with me about that, and I would uh, I would take them seriously if you heard otherwise. But you know, my guess is that that part of it you might be able to kind of get down in a lot of different ways. Um, there's part of doing what. This particular kind of design that I do, graphic design, which is different than product design, which would be designing, say, uh, well, classical product design is designing something like cars and toothbrushes. Um, digital product design is designing things like um, apps and other kind of, uh, of digital pro uh, products, or architecture, or fashion design, or interior design. They're all forms of design. What makes graphic design specifically interesting is that um, the work that we're doing is almost always done on behalf of clients who are trying to communicate something to an audience somehow. So it could be a political candidate who's trying to get people to vote for them. It could be a um, 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 a startup who's trying to raise money and project an air of, uh, of, of confidence and uh, capability so that people trust them with investments and then trust them to uh, deliver whatever it is they claim to want to do as a startup. It could be a publisher who has a complicated idea for a book with a lot of words and pictures and needs someone to figure out how those words and pictures are going to get on paper. It could be a television show that needs a thing at the beginning that sort of says the name of the show in a way that gives you a sense of what the show is about. It could be um, a uh, uh, you know, um, you know, someone who's selling something online and they need a website that will actually permit people to kind of like log on and buy whatever it is they're selling, right? So all of these, um, each one of these situations requires not just those craft skills that I was talking about, knowing different software programs that actually help you do the work, but you have to actually be able to understand what the problem is you're being presented with. Uh, you have to. Uh, you have to understand, you know, something about political science if you're working on a political campaign. You have to understand something about uh, uh, marketing and or economics if you're working on a transactional website. You have to understand something about literature and or visual storytelling if you're working on a book. And I think those are the things where a university level or college level education actually helps. Um, I, you know, I... Um, I think that kind of the broader your knowledge is about the world on every level, the more effective you are as a graphic designer because the work you do has to engage all those different parts of the world. I would say that if you're, and I don't want to put down product designers at all, but if you're designing a toothbrush, you can kind of like capture all the information it takes to sort of do an effective toothbrush with a, with a, a bunch of different uh, uh, kind of statistical metrics that actually describe the shape of people's mouths and how their fists hold the brush and what dentists say is the most effective way of removing plaque from teeth. Um, you know, if you're designing a book, you, you know, you sort of have to know what it's like to read a book. You have to understand what, what the difference is between one kind of book and another and what one kind of book looks like versus another kind of book. You have to understand what the tradition of bookmaking is all about. You have to, have a sense of even if this kind of book usually looks like that, but how much do you want to have it look exactly the way it usually looks or how much do you want to break from that mold? And these are really, really subtle distinctions that I was not even that good at the day I graduated from college. And I've gotten better at it since then through experience. Right. So um, uh, I'd say doing what I do requires 
um, all kinds of education, some of which is probably best acquired, you know, um, through a college degree, but some of it is acquired through lived experience. And all of it sort of relies on just sort of having an insatiable and exhaustible sense of curiosity yeah. well, about and, and the world around you. Uh, this is a field that really pays that off well, I would say. Yeah. And, you know, talking about experience, one of the really interesting time periods uh, of your past that I'd be really curious to hear more about would be the time that you spent with Massimo Vignelli. Um, I'm, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was right out of school. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I, I heard, um, go, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I heard you talk a little bit about um, working your first shift, going home, coming back. <laughs> yeah. And so I'd be curious to hear a little bit about how hard work specifically played a role in you uh, advancing in your career and, and experience. Um, and then just maybe some new details about kind of your time with him and how that um, made a difference for you. Oh, sure, Dustin. Thank you. Um, yeah, my first job out of school um, was in New York City working for a, a really important and eventually legendary designer named uh, Massimo Vignelli, who was uh, born in Italy, had moved to the United States in the late 50s and practiced most of his career in in the U.S., ultimately in New York, where he had an office where he uh, designed things of great influence. When I started working for him, he had designed everything from um, all the signs in the, the, the first time I came to New York, he had designed all the signs for the New York City subway system and the map that told you how the subway operated. So basically, your ability to get around in the city using public transportation was uh, a product of a bunch of different kind of design decisions that this, that Massimo Vignelli had made uh, in his studio a few years before. Um, he designed the logos of several big department stores in town. So everywhere you'd go, you see people holding shopping bags that, that had logos that he had designed. He did everything from designing the, you know, the, the layout of the pipe organ in a church that I walked by every day to, um, uh, to designing kind of like uh, the plastic cups that we actually uh, had in our kitchen of my first apartment in New York, right? So really great designer who worked across all sorts of different fields. And I was really fortunate to have a job there as an entry-level designer in 1980. So that was, what, 37 years ago. And um, uh, the profession was very different then. There were no computer. The, the only computer we had in the office maybe might have been there might have been some kind of computer in our bookkeeper's office. But I'm not even sure that was true. Yeah. And certainly, my desk just looked like a classic art studio. It had a drawing board and you know uh, paintbrushes and you know rulers and ruling pens, triangles, erasers, stuff like that. Right. So what we did was what I did as an entry level designer was very very menial. Um, there was lots of menial work to be done in a studio like that, so I spent a lot of time just mixing things, taping things down, wrapping things up, cutting things out, doing all this stuff to help other, um, help other more senior designers do their work, right? Um, but I was like really happy because all the work that was being done there was interesting. It was, uh, I thought, in my naive way, really cool looking, if nothing else. The clients were interesting and seemed important and exotic to me. Uh, the fact that I w I'd led a very kind of um, uh, sheltered life uh, growing up in Ho Ohio, which seemed like the middle of nowhere to this exotic Italian boss. Suddenly I was in New York City working for someone with a very cosmopolitan worldview. All of that was like really thrilling to me, right? So I, my education in a way, uh, you know, concluded, my formal education concluded when I graduated from college in Ohio, uh, but a different kind of education began when I started my first job, you know, a week later in New York City working for uh, uh, Massimo Vignelli. Um, and I, there was one bit of luck that I, uh, that was just kind of an accident where uh, um, a couple things came together. I was newly married. I married my high school sweetheart and the two of us kind of uh, uh, moved into our first apartment, which happened to be just three blocks away from 
the studio that I work, where I work. Um, my lovely wife, however, got a job all the way to downtown in um, Lower Manhattan. At the, I, I, we, we, we lived in, I lived and worked in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. She got a job all the way downtown in the World Trade Center, or One World Trade. Um, and um, she, she had to start work at eight o'clock. She, you know, she was like doing a financial thing down there. I didn't have to start till nine thirty. Um, she had to get up like two hours before, you know, she had to get up at six o'clock every morning because she had to get dressed up like a businesswoman and uh, then take a subway for, you know, 45 minutes downtown. I could just kind of roll out of bed dressed like a designer and sneakers and uh, uh, blue jeans and a t-shirt and walk literally five minutes to work. Yeah. So that meant that I generally slept in like as many as three hours later than my wife did every morning. Uh, and so that meant when I came home, she would go to bed three hours before I did. And so I got in the habit because our apartment was so small and so claustrophobic that after we, I'd come home, we would eat dinner together. We talk about our days. Um, she would, um, we'd wash the dishes, watch the TV, then she'd go to bed. And sometimes at that point I just would, um, uh, you know, feel restless in that apartment. And I just would walk back to our, uh, uh, to the place where I worked because I had a key. I'd go in there, turn on the lights, and I just would do design stuff for three or four more hours before I got tired. And then I'd come home like at, you know, one, two in the morning and go to bed at three, sleep a good six hours, and then, um, you know, <laughs> go wake up the next morning at like 9, 10 a.m. and go to work by 9.30, you know, three hours after my wife had gotten up. And so um, this whole thing of doing this, it was really strange um, because um, I can't say I was doing this because I was particularly ambitious. I just loved doing design work so much that I just, um, it was just such fun for me to do that it was, you know, I would rather do that than anything else. I didn't want to watch TV. I didn't want to uh, uh, go to bars and drink. I sort of like, there was nothing, to, you know, and yeah. there was not much do actually after midnight anyway and we didn't have any money that I could do anything uh, so because uh, we we're just living on um, kind of starter salaries the two of us in a pretty expensive city so I so I ended up putting in all this extra time and I sort of like learned that um, I read afterwards actually that um, if you the, 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 if you really kind of work hard really early in your career it sort of is an investment in that'll pay off over the whole course of your career. And sometimes I actually think that uh, um, all the success I've had in my life is because of those first, you know, um, those first handful of years where I was kind of like working, just cheerfully working these like 16 hour days without giving it a second thought, just because I thought it was fun, you know? Um, I don't force the people who work for me to work like that and kind of try to discourage them from it. I don't work that way anymore, partly because I'm too old and I can't do it. And I just kind of go to bed early and I, uh, uh, you know, just don't have the capacity for it that I used to. But I do think the time that I invested in it then really did end up paying off for me uh, later on. And maybe um, I'm not sure I can make I can make that as a universal recommendation. But I will say that uh, um there's two steps to it, really. The second step is to work your butt off. But the first step is try to find something to do that you love doing so much that it doesn't seem like work. If you do that first step, the second step is easy. Yeah. Well, and I, I was going to ask you about advice you'd give to a student unsure about what they would want to do. And that sounds like the advice you might give. Would you add anything to that? Um. No, I, I mean, I think that um, um, there's – people are um, – you know, how, how do I put this? We, we live, I mean, the, when I entered the workforce, um, you know, as a young adult in 1980, it was – in a way, it was, like, very um, structured and rigid and kind of calcified, you know? Um, me and everyone else I knew what had one goal, which was to get hired for a full-time job somewhere and then just work there as long as possible until either you got bored and quit or you got 
fired for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I ended up working that first job for 10 years. I, I'm sort of like, I'm not prone to a lot of, I'm not, I, I don't think I really have that much of a restless personality. As it turns out, I'm sort of content to kind of like hit on something that I like and just do it to death, probably past the point of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, where a reasonable person would go. Yeah. Um, but I think that, um, uh, it, it, in a way, the proposition was simple and very rigid back in those days. I think people today have so many more options in terms of how they can explore their interests that um, um, I think that, I mean, my advice is everyone's, you know, the, the, thing, the thing you're most interested in, the thing you would do for free, if you can figure out a way to take something that makes you so interested, you'd like to do it for free and to convert that into a, um, into a paying job. That's like the perfect situation. I'm not sure that everyone can do that. And I'm not sure that, that I, and I think there are certain jobs that I, I can't picture people wanting to do it just out of pure passion, but that might just be my own lack of imagination. I think there's a lot of things that I do that normal people would think are kind of like impossibly esoteric and downright boring. And how can you be so interested in, you know, the differences between, you know, typefaces and fonts or the differences between, you know, a, uh, you know, a slightly improved logo and the way it looked before it was slightly improved, you know, but I, I find those things really fascinating and, um, and I get excited by them. Right. And I think they're that, you know, there are probably accountants who just uh, take a lot of satisfaction in a row of figures that adds up perfectly. And there's probably dental hygienists who kind of take a kind of satisfaction in a perfectly clean set of teeth and a bill of good dental health. And I think that, um, you know, if, if people somehow can um, uh, just try to align what they find interesting with what the world is willing to pay you to do, that's sort of the perfect outcome. I don't think you, I was lucky. I think I, I sort of, I decided what I wanted to do like really early on. And then I just kind of uh, uh, bore down on it with um, this kind of single-minded relentlessness that I don't think is either typical or to tell you the truth, that advisable. Yeah. Um, um, I think, I think there are people that have had more interesting lives than I have because they've had episodic uh, careers and tried different things. And uh, there's a whole, I'll, I'll go to my grave without having tried most things in the world that other people, you know, that, that, that I, I might, that might've been opportunities for me, you know? So I'm not sure my advice is actually uh, easy to universalize or, uh, um, or necessarily uh, something that I, I certainly haven't recommended to my own children who have done very different things than I have myself. So, um, but I think that, I think that's sort of like, um, uh, you know, being interested in what you do and feeling like it's making a real contribution to your own sense of satisfaction and better still to the world at large is sort of the ideal state. Yeah. All right. And I've got only one more question. Um, and it wraps around kind of your, your thoughts on legacy that you might want to leave uh, specifically in the industry. But, um, you know, one of the, the two things that I've really noticed about you over my design kind of career that I've been working through has been your humility and kind of the perspective mm -hmm. that you bring to design. I feel like you express those two things um, consistently and very, very well. So I'd be curious to hear what your, what legacy that you would want to leave uh, to the design community or, or just in life as a, as a whole. Um, I was, I was, it's funny. I was actually thinking about this because I read I was I was like looking at someone I follow on Twitter surprised me by saying this posting something about how irritating they found it when people called when students or other or young professionals call to ask them for free advice and they're sort of like I've got better things to do than give free advice to people my time is worth something and I uh, it's insulting to me when people don't value that time. And I was actually really surprised by this and even slightly angered by it. But, uh, and, and the reason was, is, um, and I started thinking about like, wow, you know, why do I, what, what rubbed me the wrong way about this? Um, the reason was that when I first got, to, when I was first looking for a job in New York, um, 
I, I remember, this is a long time ago now, this is like almost 40 years ago, but I can remember with absolute clarity, you know, specific moments of encouragement and kindness that I got from people. Um, you know, just an invitation to come and talk, a compliment about something I had done, a word of advice that actually made a difference. You know, um, they have they had this impact on me that was just monumental. And I bet that most of those people, you know, it was just, you know, I was some kid who may have been an inconvenience in the day they forgot why they agreed to see, but they saw me and they decided to, you know, help me out to the degree they could and then got on with the more important things in their lives that day, right back in 1979 or whenever it was, right? But to me, those things were just like life-changing. And I think it's, you know, every day I'll get an email from someone or someone will reach out to me and ask me for some bit of advice or some little bit of time to help them out. And I try to make a point to do that whenever I can and every time I can. And so like there's, you know, I kind of pride myself on, I don't answer every email. I guess some people are just trying to sell me things I don't want or some people are just selling, you know, I I get emails that like, I've obviously been sent to a thousand other people without, uh, you know, they're like form letters. But if, if, uh, you know, if a student or some, or a young designer um, sends me a note and asks for advice or just says, you know, you know, I'm looking for a job and we just hope, you know, was hoping you could, um, you know, uh, uh, take a look at my website or whatever. I, I always, one way or another, and sometimes it'll, sometimes it'll take me hours, days, weeks, occasionally months, but sooner or later, I respond to every single one of those emails. And the reason I do it is, um, and I, sometimes I respond just by saying, yeah, I check out your stuff. And I think this thing, you know, this one, this one thing you did was really cool and looks like it's a sweet spot for you. Or, you know, here's, here's, here's something you might want to check out that I've seen that looks like it aligns with the kind of things you're into. Good luck. You know, very seldom do I have a job I can give these people. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll connect with them face to face and I'll sort of like spend some time with them that way. And I think all the time when I'm doing it, what I'm trying to do is take sort of, you know, do that classic cliched thing where I'm taking the gift that I was given uh, 40 years ago by someone who doesn't remember me at all and pass that on to uh, this new person in hopes that they'll do the same, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 years later to someone else, right? And, um, and what's really funny is I will, I've been doing this long enough now that I'll run into people saying, you know, do you remember me? I saw you back in 1987 when you were a senior designer working for Vignella and you said something to me I'll never forget. And I swear to God, like for one thing I'll think, why was, why was anyone taking anything I said seriously when I was that young? But then I'll also like seldom be able to remember this encounter that's being described as so vividly to me. And then, I, you know, but of course, I, you know, it's not hard to figure out what's going on. You know, that was just, you know, that was something I was doing between three other things I had to do that morning back in on some day in 1987. But for that person, that was like their big moment where they kind of rode an elevator up to the 14th floor at 475 10th Avenue and had an appointment with some schmo who worked for Massimo Vignelli, you know, so it's a big deal for them. And, um, and you know, every moment you have, uh, you know, like all day long, you have these moments where, it may be nothing to you, but may be important to someone else. And it's actually really hard to figure out what the, uh, what those important moments are. So I tried my, I tried to kind of just, uh, um, you know, when in doubt, I just assume that this is important to someone and I have a chance just to say something that they may not give a damn about, but might actually be something useful for them. And if I had a legacy, I think professionally, at least it would be that, um, there's a bunch of people who, you know, at one moment or another in their lives, I managed to say something that was helpful to them. Um, and I think there are probably just as many people who what I said was useless and forgettable. But I think as long as you keep doing it enough, you raise your odds of at least a few people um, uh, getting some benefit from one's wisdom, right? So yeah. I'd say professionally, you know, in terms of um, the world of design, if I had that as a legacy, I'd really be proud of myself. And I think I had done a, uh, a good job. And it's like, it's, and it's, I don't want to kind of come off as stuck off as, as like, 
stuck up or conceited or someone who thinks that, you know, um, the whole world needs to line up to be told by me what to do. Um, but to me, I think if you just have the example of, um, you know, valuing every person and what they care about and the work that they're doing as you would want to be valued yourself, I think you can't go wrong. I think there's something in the Bible about that that probably is still true. Yeah, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm really glad to hear you say that. Uh, one of the, I had reached out to your office maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, I had a presentation with a client um, and I was super nervous about it. So I thought, well, I would be curious to hear what you have to say about it. Uh, you, were, you were out of town, you were overseas at the time. But I found a interview that you did with somebody and you were talking about the time that you presented to your brother and you were like, if I could, if I could <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. talk to every client this way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so I took that advice, and honestly, like, it was one of the better presentations I had ever given, and so, like, even little things like that um, helped me, um, and so, I, you know, I feel like a lot of what you have to say, like I said, your perspective on design is so, there's a lot of clarity in it, and I think that that'll help students, so I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, um, and in turn, talk to uh, a lot of a lot of people about what you do. Oh, um, um, Dustin, I, I, I appreciate you saying that. So, and I will say the one thing that's true today that wasn't true when I was first, you know, when I was a high school student in, or uh, studying design at the University of Cincinnati or looking for a job as a new graduate. Um, um, what you know. There, there, there was, there was no internet back then, so you couldn't find things. You couldn't research. You know, you could go to like the library and look up things in a card catalog and sort of hope that they would have a book that would be relevant to the subject you were interested in. But that was actually the more esoteric your interests were, the less likely that would be to happen. The one thing that's really true today is that there's just so much information out there um, and and so much wisdom available if you are patient and you look for it and you let your own curiosity make your path for you. And so I think a lot of times people imagine that, you know, what they really want is, um, um, you know, they want a mentor. They want someone who's going to be like their, their Yoda who will, you know, give them personal advice at every critical moment of their lives. And, you know, if you're lucky enough to have that, um, uh, good for you. But what I've discovered is that, you know, there's, you know, hundreds and thousands and millions of people willing to do that for you. And they're, they don't even, and they're, they do that in the form of just having left something valuable behind as part of the public record. You know, you just kind of can, um, you know, do some research and find something that's relevant about making a presentation that, you know, that could be like, um, uh, like that thing you found from me, but probably if you kept looking, there would be, 10 other people giving you different kinds of advice, all of which would be interesting and worth considering. And, you know, you could have a, you know, a dozen mentors, you know, kind of advising you on how to do that thing without any of them being any the wiser. And so I think that, um, uh, you know, you don't do that because it's, you know, because it's homework or you have to, you do that just because you find it interesting. And when you get the valuable advice, you take it on not because someone's told you to, but because it resonates with what you care about, right? So yeah. I think you should be, I encourage everyone to be kind of greedy and thirsty and uh, um, just focused on, you know, on taking advantage of what the world has to offer. And it's all out there. And you, you for most of it, you don't even have to ask for permission. It's all just waiting for you to... Uh, uh, it's all waiting to be discovered. And all you have to do is be interested in it and uh, um, have the capacity to respond to the things that satisfy that curiosity. Yeah, well, I um, it. yeah, no, I really thank you uh, for doing the interview and I really appreciate the advice. Um, 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 thank you, these were fun questions and um, 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 it was really a pleasure talking to you. If anything else from you, let me know, send me a note and now that we've made contact, it'll be easy to uh, close the loop and anything else you got, okay? okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.